On Wednesday, 9th October 1907, the first day the dose loss exceeded 30% for the year, Arthur did some calculations that convinced him short sellers were behind the drop in the price of United Copper. Otto assumed that between them, Fritz and Charles Morse, who had gotten his shares in the swap that saw him send shares in his American Ice Company to Fritz, owned the majority of the shares of United Copper, and that it was these shares, as well as the ones Arthur had purchased at Fritz's direction, sitting on deposit at various brokerages, that were being loaned to speculators in order to affect their short sales. Fritz's own stock was being used against him. One potential solution was to pay off the loans Arthur had incurred when he started buying United Copper stock at Fritz's direction and demand delivery of every stock certificate on deposit. But the Heinz brothers, knowing how pressure exerted against amalgamated copper had worked to their advantage, believed that if they also bought even more shares of United Copper just as they were demanding delivery of the shares they already owned, they would pressure or squeeze the short sellers, forcing them to pay a higher price than they might have otherwise. But demanding the return of all the shares on deposit would require enough cash to pay off the loans that were secured by the shares, as well as cash to buy the additional shares that would squeeze the short-selling speculators. The simple stock buying pool Arthur was running in Fritz's direction was risky. This plan would be an order of magnitude riskier. The next day, Thursday, 10th October, Otto went to Fritz, asking for the nearly $2 million he estimated would be needed to execute this plan. Fritz refused. During the previous four months, beginning just after he'd assumed ownership and taken control of the Mercantile National Bank, depositors, fearful of his new leadership in the era before deposit insurance, had withdrawn $4 million, a significant portion of the bank's deposits, and Fritz needed to preserve his capital. This silent run, on the Mercantile National also meant the bank wasn't able to lend the money to Otto. But Fritz was sympathetic to Otto's plan. In an effort to implement Otto's scheme, Fritz arranged a meeting for them with Morse and Morse friend and colleague Charles Barney, the president of the Knickerbocker Trust Company, the third largest trust company in New York. Morse and Barney were longtime business partners in a variety of enterprises, including Morse American Eyes, where Barney was a shareholder and where he had been a director since 1900, as well as various other stock pools, even ownership of Broadway's Hotel Rosmo. When the four men sat to discuss United Copper, Morse said he believed Otto's estimate of $2 million was far short of the amount actually needed. Morse thought they would need $3 million. $2 million had been too much to raise, and $3 million was out of the question. On the next trading day, Saturday, 12th October, United Copper's stock opened at $45.50 before dropping to $37.75 because, at least in part, that day's newspapers reported that a large producer was unsuccessfully attempting to sell several million pounds of copper at 13 cents per pound, which was below the cost of production. Miners were now losing money with each shovel full of copper or they dug out of the ground. Saturday's drop in the share price prompted more margin calls. The brokers who had bought United Copper shares on credit, at Arthur's direction, were demanding additional collateral for the loans, in the form of cash. It became obvious to the brothers that additional margin calls, 
which were certain to come if the price of United Copper dropped any further, would wipe out the Heinz liquid reserves and result in the failure of Auto C, Heinz and company. Knowing this, desperate for a solution, and illogically hoping that the downdraft in United Copper had been a result of short selling and not liquidation by owners of the shares in the face of that morning's news, Otto decided to execute his plan to corner the stock of United Copper and squeeze the short sellers without informing Fritz. He was going to put his plan into action, even if he had to go it alone without any capital. Not only was Otto on his own and without capital, but also the broad stock market was working against him. The dough closed that Saturday at just 62.34, down 33.9% for the year and 7.9% for the month as investors wondered what stocks were worth if there was no limit to President Roosevelt's attacks on business. On Sunday, 13th October, Otto gave orders for the brokerage firm of Gross and Kleber to buy 6,000 shares of United Copper at ascending prices when trading resumed on Monday. He also began to call for some of the shares of United Copper on deposit with various brokerage firms to be delivered to the offices of Heinz and Company. With this call for the shares, Fritz's loans would become due the moment the shares were delivered to Otto's office. On Monday, 14th October, United Copper stock opened for trading at $39.88, up to $1.63 from Saturday's close, and as the pace of Otto's own buying increased, the price jumped to $40, then $41, then to $49.88 and eventually to $60. Before lunch, Otto had managed to drive the price of United Copper higher by almost $23, about 60% above where it had closed the previous trading day. After falling back a bit, United Copper closed that Monday at $52.88, a rally of $15.13, or 40%. Otto's scheme seemed to be working. The next morning's Chicago Tribune led its business coverage with the story of the stunning rally in United Copper, a headline reported that the Heinz brothers buying puts a big crimp in those who sold the stock short. While Otto was buying, and would soon have to pay for, additional shares, the stock certificates he had demanded were arriving in his office, and he needed to make a payment of $630,000, which he did not have. But Otto's buying had potentially solved the problem for him, with United Copper trading at nearly $60, the total amount of cash needed for his plan was greatly reduced from his initial estimate of $2 million. When Otto went to Fritz at the end of the day on Monday, beseeching him again for capital, Fritz was more impressed by how well the scheme seemed to be working than he was angry at Otto's recklessness. Fritz gave in and arranged for the Mercantile National to cover any checks Otto wrote. With the Mercantile National backing him, Otto sprang his trap and issued calls for all remaining United Copper shares on deposit with the various brokers before the market opened the next day. Tuesday, 15th October. He was certain that the brokers would be unable to deliver the shares, as he assumed they had been loaned to the short sellers, and that he had all the available shares already sitting in his office or on their way. United Copper opened for trading at $50 on Tuesday, just below Monday's closing price of $52.88, 
and during the morning it traded as high as $59 on heavy volume. But just as Otto was expecting to be notified of defaults by the brokerages not able to deliver the shares due, the shares he'd demanded instead started to arrive in his office. The trickle of stock certificates grew to a rush and then a flood just after lunch as every share due was delivered. The flow became so great that Otto, not knowing how to stem the tide and unable to pay, began refusing delivery of the shares he had demanded just that morning. Otto, so certain that the short sellers were responsible for the drop in United Copper's price, so certain that the brokerages wouldn't be able to deliver the shares due, had gotten it completely wrong. When the brokers for whom the shares had served as collateral realized that Otto wasn't going to take delivery and pay off the loans due, they became desperate. The only thing to do was turn to the market to get whatever they could. During the last hour of trading on Tuesday, as these shares hit the market, United Copper's price fell from $59 to $50 then $45 before closing at $36, down 31.9% for the day and below where it had ended the previous week. United Copper was now below the level that had moved Auto to act and substantially lower than the prices he'd paid on Monday and Tuesday. When the market opened on Wednesday, 16th October, there was no place for the Heinz brothers to hide. Newspapers would report that copper prices reached an all-time low on this day, and that news crushed any remaining opportunity for Otto's plan to succeed. Shares of United Copper were thrown on the market at the open, and in a final insult, Otto refused to pay Gross and Kleberg for the shares they had bought at his direction on Monday and Tuesday with the goal of sparking the short squeeze. Those shares were also sold for whatever they might bring. United Copper opened for trading at $30 on Wednesday, another $6 below Tuesday's close. Three minutes later, it was down to $20 as the wave of selling crested. At the close, it was trading at $10, making Fritz's stock in United Copper worth a fraction of the loans taken against it. Fritz Heinz, the copper king of Montana, was broke. How had Otto and Arthur gotten it so wrong? What made them think that short sellers were active in United Copper, depressing the price in such a way that they were vulnerable? The selling hadn't been short selling. The fact that all the shares on deposit had been tendered as auto demanded was proof that it had been an owner of a substantial number of shares in United Copper liquidating his holdings as copper prices fell. One contemporary writer said there was a strange fatality about friendship with Charles Morse, and the Heinz brothers ultimately came to believe it was Morse, Fritz's friend and mentor, who was secretly selling the shares he'd received from Fritz, shares he was supposed to hold for investment. Hill, Morgan, and Harriman's wild buying of Northern Pacific in 1901 as they tried to gain control, had caused the price to rise to $1,000 in a massive but inadvertent short squeeze that punished the broad market. The Heinz's own buying of United Copper in 1907 hadn't led to a short squeeze even though, ironically, that had been the goal. An inadvertent short squeeze in 1901 had punished the broad market the unsuccessful short squeeze in 1907 would similarly punish the broad market. When Fritz's self-dealing loans became known, he was forced to resign from the Mercantile National Bank on the evening of Wednesday, 
16th October, after less than nine months as its president. Friends tried to explain away the resignation by saying, he did not pretend to knowledge of the banking business and that he meant rather learn the business as president of the mercantile than personally to direct its operations. These friends didn't explain why he would be president of a bank if he had no knowledge of the banking business or why the president of a bank wouldn't be expected to personally direct its operations. Fritz Heinz, who had $12 million in cash at the beginning of the year, was broke, as were the New York stock exchange firms of Gross and Kleber which had done autos buying and not gotten paid, and Otto Heinz and company. The smashing of the corner in United Copper stock wasn't merely a spectator sport for investors. On 16th October, the day United Copper traded down to $10, the broad market fell in both fear and sympathy, with the Dow losing to 0.6% to close at 60.46. The Dow was now down 35.9% for the year and 10.7% for the month. The rumors promptly started in earnest. Fritz had been bankrupted, and he and Otto had taken Otto Heinz and company and Gross and Kleberg with them. If the damage had stopped there, the episode would have been merely an exercise in Schadenfred, as Heinz's former antagonists at Amalgamated gleefully watched his fortune evaporate. Instead, the questions of who else might be involved, and who else might be exposed and overleveraged, were asked. On Friday, 18th October, the rumors were focused on Charles Barney, the fourth person at the original meeting with Fritz, Otto, and Morse to discuss squeezing the shorts in United Copper. Was Barney, and more important, was the Knickerbocker Trust involved in the failed corner? With this question being asked, it seemed that the damage would extend beyond a small group of reckless speculators to the nation's bedrock financial institutions, Stocks sunk further, losing to 0.3% on Friday, 18th October, as the Dow closed at 59.13, its first close below 60 in more than three years. It lost another 0.8% on Saturday's shortened session, a day when the Wall Street Journal called the failed corner one of the most absurd pieces of speculative jugglery ever attempted. The Dow was down 5.9% for the week, 13.4% for the month, 37.8% for the year, and 42.6% since making its all-time high in January of the previous year. Fritz was out, and on Saturday, 19th October, Morse was soon to be out as well. The New York Clearing House the group that cleared checks and presented them to the proper bank for payment had agreed to support the Mercantile National Bank with a loan, but the price of their support was the resignation of Charles Morse from any position of leadership in any bank with which he was affiliated. One of Morse's closest friends was Charles Barney which explains why Barney was at the original meeting to discuss cornering United Copper stock. Barney was attractive and courtly but high-strung. The son of a prosperous Cleveland merchant who moved his family to New York when Charles was six, Barney had returned to New York after graduating from Williams College. Barney did well by marrying Lucy Collins Whitney, the sister of a financer, secretary of the Navy, and patriarch of the Whitney family William Whitney. Barney joined the Knickerbocker Trust Company in 1884, and by 1897 had become president. In 1907 the Knickerbocker Trust had 18,000 depositors, 
and during the decade since he'd taken over, Barney had increased deposits by a factor of six. But despite the sober-sounding name, trust companies were new financial contraptions that were circling the edges of what the law allowed and testing the limits of what might survive in times of stress. In the last half of the 1800s traditional banks weren't able to accept trust accounts such as wills and estates, so those customers were directed to newly formed trust companies. With a large and expanding customer base, and unencumbered by many of the laws that constrained traditional banks, trust companies started to accept savings deposits. The trust company's primary advantage was the lack of a legal requirement that they maintain any reserves on hand to facilitate even the most basic banking functions. Meanwhile, the nationally chartered banks were required to reserve as much as 25% of their deposits in cash in their vaults, generating no income. As such, the trust companies in 1901 were able to pay anywhere between 2 and 5% interest on deposit accounts, while most banks paid none. The cost of this freedom was those trust companies operated outside the clearinghouse structure allowed for the direct clearing of checks drawn on other institutions and often provided temporary loans when a bank was under stress. Trust companies would instead have to clear through the courtesy of a member bank, a privilege that might be suspended at any time, and couldn't hope for any loan from the clearinghouse. After 1900, as assets in trust companies grew, those assets were put to work in riskier ventures, including bridge loans for industrial mergers, as well as the underwriting of stock and bond issuance, like a modern-day investment bank. Often these risks led to others, the freedom to underwrite bond and stock issuance led to additional risk as the trust company would often hold unmarketed securities they had underwritten in their own portfolio, hoping that the price of the securities would climb but liable for losses if the price fell. One contemporary observer remarked that the trust companies were generally regarded as unsafe and even piratical. Trust companies had come to combine the worst elements of two modern-day financial institutions, the savings and loan, and the hedge fund. While trust companies were novel, insecure, and untested in a crisis, their management continued to press expansion. The Knickerbocker Trust had been founded in 1884 by Fred Eldridge, an old friend, and classmate of J. P. Morgans, and by 1907, with Charles Barney entering his second decade as its president, it stood in quite elegance at the corner of 5th Avenue and 34th Street, across from the original Waldorf Astoria. Once depositors got inside the Knickerbocker Trust building, clad in marble and fronted by four massive columns, they saw more marble, bronze, and mahogany woodwork. The main banking room soared to consume three of the building's four stories, and though the result was impressive and reassuring, it wasn't enough. In August 1907, the Knickerbocker announced plans for a 22-story building at the corner of Broadway and Exchange Place, in the heart of the Wall Street district. On Sunday, 6 October 1907, the New York Times reported the building would cost $3.5 million, and the top floor penthouse would be devoted to dining rooms, kitchens and serving rooms solely for the use of officers and employees. Not everyone was blind to the dangers of trust companies. As early as 1874, bankers were warning that trust companies 
had been converted into stock jobbing concerns apparently for the benefit of stock operators. Alexander Dana Nois noted in 1901 that the trust companies were not designed for the function they now served and that the phenomenal rise of these institutions has occurred in a series of years of great prosperity. No institution or system can be pronounced entirely safe which has not been tried by fire in a financial crisis and the trust company system as now conducted, has not been thus tried. Three weeks later, the Knickerbocker Trust would be tried by fire and would fail.